First of all, what I'd like to do is um, just ask a few that are sitting right up the back just to move up into the front front rows. This so we're not spread out too much for Ross. It'll be much easier for Ross when he's actually um, <coughs> presenting that he, he actually gets to get his eye on everyone and dad and kind of cast his eye right up the back. And, uh, um, when this guy uh, starts weaving his magic, it's pretty exciting. And we've only really heard a little bit of it, so yeah. Thank you for that. So, um, just a couple of things. Um, thanks for coming for a start. Like this is just the uh, launch of um, some really exciting things that Rooted Roar is all about. And uh, but Rooted Roar is more than just Rooted Roar. Obviously, it's about a community of some really like-minded people uh, that are um, right from the start. For myself, you know, I've been excited about Holt and well-being for quite a while. Uh, it's been about a seven-year journey for me. And uh, it's just been a continual passion to want to uh, support community and people with amazing food. And uh, so I've taken my um, connection with food to a whole new level and I've never been healthier. And uh, so I feel for myself as part of what my role is within Rooted Raw is be an inspiration to people that this is what you can actually do as a person. Um, and uh, got some really exciting things happening. One of the things that I'll share amongst quite a few things leading up to that, for 2020, um, you'll uh, get to see that I'll be running from the furthest western point of Australia to the furthest eastern point and running 50 kilometres a day for 100 days, and that'll get me right across Australia. So, and we're going to do a movie and a documentary on it. Uh, but, and by then, Rooted Raw would have got a lot of really good recognition for what we're doing and, and why we're capable of doing that sort of thing as a community. Um, phones, could I just ask everybody just to check that their phones are uh, switched off. And if you need to leave the room to go to the toilet, if you can please just go this way and around the back, just so when Mark's up the back recording, um, that you're actually not having to duck underneath the camera and so forth. That, that'll make that a lot easier. Um, and just recognise that with Mark recording, um, we really want to capture what Ross has got to say today. Uh, so it'll be important that we, you know, we're not chatting and that there's the noise is right down and we're as far as uh, us sitting back there and uh, we can capture everything Ross is saying. Uh, toilets. When you go back out, just walk around the back through that door and then you'll walk along the back of the uh, this room here and you'll see a red door and the men and men's and women's are just off to your left. We're gonna take a break at 12 o'clock for lunch uh, and all the food will be set up out there. It is amazing food. You know, I spent all day Thursday with the raw food. Um, uh, artisan. artisan, yeah, we're gonna remember that one. Yeah, she's amazing the way she just weaves her magic around food. It's incredible. Uh, and then, yeah, last night, um, spent quite a while you know, preparing a few other things. So that's gonna be a real special part of what we do. So we can actually show all of you uh, our values around food. Because we know that, you know, the, the food is gonna be a real reflection of who we are and how we operate. Um, so I think, um, so we're gonna take a break at 12 for lunch and then, then we'll come back at 12.45. Uh, and the first part of what Ross is gonna talk about is the history of law. Uh, um, and then from the, after the break uh, to afternoon tea, uh, we're gonna talk about um, how law exists uh, today. Is that, that's the right order, is it, Ross? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, then from 2.45 to 3.45, It'll be uh, future opportunities. So more about where we're heading and, and how we can actually really get things to change in a really beautiful way. Um, so yeah, and that you'll be able to have a snack then. Uh, also, if anybody wants any water, there's plenty of water just out in the kitchen also. Um, and take, you know, just take the opportunity to get that if you need some water. So the first thing I wanna do is actually um, just do a really short presentation or representation of the core team that's come together as part of uh, Rooted Raw and, uh, and then launched with Ross and let him do what he's got to do. So the um, Andrea, who I just mentioned, um, I'll just give you a little bit of uh, an idea of what Andrea's about. Andrea is an absolutely awesome raw food chef. Uh, she's not only more, she's more than a chef. 
Uh, so we prefer to call her a artisan, basically because of the way she just connects with food. She's an artist when it comes to creating food. Um, she brings a wealth of knowledge about raw food and how to make and, ta and make it taste incredible. Has a huge amount of experience in the whole food and raw food industry, and this combined with an enduring work ethic, enthusiasm, the enthusiasm, and a beautiful nature, make her absolutely a keystone to Rooted Raw. So that's Andrew. She's actually out working today, um, preparing food. So she's going to be here at 4:30. Um, ben, uh, just another really good introduction to what we do. Uh, ben actually, she's got seven years of experience. She's only uh, 25. Yeah, I think she's only 25. And so she's more in the production and the delivery and promotion of the community engagement uh, programs and logistics around Rooted Raw. So when we take food out to communities, um, what she does, she really brings an amazing energy uh, to a team of people. Um, like, you know, sometimes I, when I'm amongst a team of people, uh, it's kind of getting in the way a little bit. Uh, but she brings an amazing energy and just brings everybody together really well. So she's another really important part of the team. Uh, this guy represents the brand, right? And it's been an incredible experience for me right from the, the beginning of what I've done and what I'm doing now, and that's to have the connection with uh, David. Uh, so David, if you wouldn't mind just coming up, just so people get an idea of who you are. Um, so David... Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah. Um, David has a first-class Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in graphic design and over 20 years' experience in the industry. For the past 16 years, David has been running his own successful business specialising in food branding and packaging. And so when I first met David, it was in at a food grocer, uh, Terra Madre, in, um, where a lot of people know. Uh, and that's where I go. Even when I lived in Warrigal, which is uh, just over an hour away, I always <coughs> had to go to get my food because I just knew that it was always really good quality food and at a good price. But I'm standing in line, run into David. We got chatting about the renovating work he's doing. At the moment, I'm actually putting extension on the back of his home and renovating the existing part of his home. And it's been an incredible experience to have that connection with this guy. I could never have got to know him, and he could never have got to know me like he has in the past couple of months. You know, I think, as you all know, when you're renovating, it is quite a challenge at times, but uh, we've you know, got through that really well. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thank uh, And Candice. Where's Candice? You can come up, Candice. Um, Candice was one of the really early ones that came on board as well and uh, brings a real, uh, just a real beauty and elegance to what we do in and around uh, her experience. Uh, she has a Bachelor of Business Management with a major in Marketing and is a Certified Project Manager. Her core, core role will be to product management and strategic marketing, including value pro uh, proposition development, strategic planning, segmentation, marketing analysts, and delivery. She is experienced in managing the end-to-end -end delivery of new products and marketing campaigns. And uh, in the time that we've um, really been having meetings and so forth, uh, yeah, when we've had meetings, there's, uh, as you can imagine when you're beginning, you're going through all sorts of challenges and belief systems around what you're doing. Uh, and the, the amount of passion in Canvas and the connection to what we're doing is really exciting. So it's great to have you on board. It really is as part of this magnificent team. <coughs> Thanks, Canvas. Yeah. Right, so, um, and then we have uh, Alistair. Um, Alistair uh, is in the, uh, is a therapist, so, um, but not your ordinary kind of therapist. Uh, he uses methods to develop and uh, from a decade of study of the human body through meditation and multi-dimensional physics. Um, having lived in eight countries, including a short term working in the, with the Chinese government, two years in the term of Alcoholic, alcoholic Anonymous, uh, and... He, he brings a wealth of experience and a new, new out, like an outlook, different outlook to what we do. And it's really um, important for us to know that we've actually got people that have got very open minds. And that's what this guy's got. Uh, thanks, Alistair. 
Cheers. Yeah. Sharon. So uh, Sharon has an advertising background and many years experience in business setup, structure and operation management. Uh, she is also has a depth of knowledge and experience in holistic healing uh, that uh, will be available for Rooted Raw. Sharon will be providing advertising marketing support, um, HR and business system development. She'll be the pivotal new product innovation. Uh, so when it comes to new products, what she actually brings to the creation of that new product is, is really amazing. And one of the other things that Sharon and I have certainly connected to, and that is um, her ability to connect with an individual and what they can bring to Rooted Raw is profound. So when it comes to us employing people, um, she'll know that that person is capable of, or, or that, that that role that they select will really work for them. You know, because we want it to work for them as much as we want them to work for us. And it's about really developing on that community. So it's, um, thanks for having me. Sharon comes out, she's done a lot of money. She's an incredible guy. He's taught me a lot about health and wellbeing. And, uh, and I rang the guy and I said, do you know somebody that's really got some really strong values around food? And, uh, and I know the credibility of this guy and he connected me to Sharon. And I just thought, yes, this must be the woman. And it is. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Kamaya. So, Kamaya, I've only known, I've known for about um, four months, but the conversations that we've had in the past four months have been profound. I've never known anybody that I can get on the phone and talk for five hours straight. So, um, it's very good flow in conversation. Uh, an incredibly intelligent woman and brings a, a real wealth of knowledge, particularly within the IT uh, and uh, the development of what we're doing, um, just takes charge. It's, it's, so as the way we all see it as part of the team, to have somebody like you on board has been really prevalent. So Kamaya has 30 years experience in the IT industry and 15 years experience in project management. Uh, she con contributes uh, innovation, IT and technology expertise uh, and project management support. Kamaya has an absolute commitment to health and fitness, vegetarian and organic for over 15 years and she is trained in various healing arts, even completing an Ironman competition aged 46 years young. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so she has quite a commitment After three kids. Yeah. And at the time I actually met Kamaya, that was in a, um, at a, a wake, and uh, we were the only two in there, and, and she kind of thought, there's something different about you, because I wasn't drinking alcohol, and, and I was the only one not eating meat as well. And she thought, wow, okay, everybody else is doing all of that, and you're not. So we had a really long conversation, we've had a connection since. So it's, it's great to have you on board as part of the team. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome, everybody. Uh, now, I guess this is the man. <laughs> yeah, um, I got to know Ross uh, through Alistair, and I was sharing with Alistair my values around health and well-being and what we're setting up, and we, and and the fact that I don't want to compromise what we're doing. You know, we really want to see that this is a very sustainable uh, project, and that it's set up in a really good way. And uh, Alistair said to me, he said, John, you need to connect with this guy. We went out for a dinner on a Thursday night, just at a local cafe here, um, and at Yon Greens actually. And uh, that weekend, I shot up to Ross's place, which is about half an hour west of Bendigo, and we spent the whole weekend hanging out together and having lots to share. Um, so what I feel that straight away, what I picked up from Ross was his, his integrity around what he does um, and what he understands around law uh, and how we can set this uh, company structure up in a really integral way, knowing that it, uh, it has an incredible, beautiful, I guess, ethos around it, and that is uh, food, health, education, and community. And we want to land that in all the most beautiful ways we possibly can without compromise, knowing that everybody is supported really well. So um, what, yeah, what you're going to hear today from Ross is pretty amazing. You, you're going to be blown away and uh, this is just the beginning of um, some pretty good uh, 
you know, times ahead of us. So, thanks, Ross. Thank you. Uh, we'll leave it with you. <laughs> Good on you, mate. <laughs> no, thanks, John. <clears throat> All right. Um, yeah, I've got a bit of interest in old English law, English history. As I said, I want to start off with the, the history. We'll talk about the present and the next session and the possible future at the end. So I'm, I'm a big one where you are, uh, if we're here now and the more you go in the past and you bring it into the present, it is easier to create the future. I'm finding a lot of people that are here and they're just going into the future and everyone's headbutting each other because they don't know their own historical facts. And so, um, and I spend a lot of time with Aboriginal communities and they're quite the opposite. They spend a lot more time in their past history and they're not meeting the future. Well, they want to meet it, but we're not offering them sound policies. It's very confusing. So here's the middle point. We're here right now, very zen. We're here right now. And uh, so the first section I want to open up, I just want to draw a map of how the crown works. When I draw this up, it makes, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And it gives you a bit of a foundation how this government was created, the constitution. I don't speak too much on the constitution, I'm more, more about the common law uh, treatises. The constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia is just basically based on three things. It's based on commerce, revenue and war. That's what creates federation. Federal governments need a war. If there's no war, there's no commerce, there's no revenue. That's why you see the United States of America, they've got to fight. You're never going to get peace in a federation. 60% of Americans export is arms, so they need to create a war. So there's no much of a healthy future when the politicians are looking for a fight. So how did that come about? And a lot of people blame the Queen. I blame anyone but their own selves, you know. It's not the Queen, right? You see it on Facebook and all that, the Queen. Everyone's just character assassinating all these personalities. You're not going to find a solution when you're looking for that sort of you know, scapegoat. So I'm going to just draw the, uh, the crown and uh, just watch how I play this out. It's quite fascinating. So we get the crown here. All right. Actually, when they, that's the old ing when they got a crown like that, it was anointed by the Catholic Church. When the Saxons had a crown, they didn't have a crown. They had a, sort of like a helmet. When the Saxon, uh, when you see. Um, uh, the Vikings, have been watching that movie The Vikings on SBS, that's a really good periodical show there, you know the king in that is a, a Christian Saxon king before that he would just have a helmet on and before the kings of the Saxons, they were Celtic kings and, they were, and the kings used to have flowers uh, like a wreath on their head and they were, called, they were called cans actually that's where you get the word can, it means can can is an old uh, English word for king so when it comes to uh, the crown, you've got the queen. I mean, she, she's part of the monarchy, right? So there's a difference between the monarchy and, uh, and the crown. So when she passes away, Charles is king, then it'll be William, then it'll be George. So they're just titulary heads. They have no real power, to be honest. Especially after the, um, royal, the uh, Glorious Revolution, about 1690s, Act of Settlement, the Queen is basically what they call a constitutional monarchy. She has no absolute power. Right, there's a bit of history there. Main divisions that come from the Queen, which we want to talk to, is uh, we've got one up here is with the, the Admiralty. I want to speak a bit in detail about how the Admiralty influence our lives. There's a bit of a dialogue on that. They've got their own courts. One of those courts is the magistrate. All right. So I'll, I'll speak a bit more about how the uh, Admiralties are influencing, but basically they're the ones who's doing all the merchant trade through the Admiralty courts. Yeah. You've got another lot, another group here, here called the House of Lords. All right, what comes out of the House of Lords is mainly two, two divisions they work with is equity and property. All 
very important because that you know, what we want to get into the courts of equity. I want to explain how you get from the magistrate court to the courts of equity. If you've got assets, if you've got finances, the equity court and the property is where you can protect your assets against a corporation that's going crazy right now. Because out of the House of Lords, a bit of history, came the House of Commons. All right, and from that, you know, they created this thing called Parliament. The way the Parliament's set up in England is completely different to our Parliament. We have a, a Senate and a House of Representatives, but it's still kind of like when the House of Commons passed a bill, the House of Lords has got a, a Senate, if it's lawful or not. And once they both come in agreement, then the Crown comes along and puts the Senate on it, then it's law. But when... Uh, from that, that's kind of like, this is how the English, I'm, I'm only just talking about the English government at present. There's another interesting one over here, it's called the, uh, the church. This is uh, Anglican, or church, church of England. It is got an Anglican slant, but there's, there's a kind of different doctrines between the Anglican and the Church of England. Uh-huh. There's another interesting one up here is at, at the academic. Academic. When you get the old schools like Oxford University, Cambridge, Eton, you know, they've got their own courts. That's where you go. If you, if you kind of mark up in the courts, they've got their own faculties to work out, you know, the rules of engagement being an academic. The Admiralties have got their own rules of engagement. It's mainly based on merchant law. All right, and that's where you get all this trade, trade all about, you know. Uh, something really happened, interesting, in about 1850s about trade law, which I'll explain a bit more down the track. <coughs> and there's another branch down here which is called the uh, Royal Courts. We, we have them in, uh, you see them in William Street, it's called the Supreme Court. All right. Usually when you see the Supreme Court, they've got the, uh, the lion and the unicorn emblem on it, yeah? Uh, uh, we want to be, when you go to an equity court, you have to go through a Supreme Court to go into an equity court. It's kind of like a, uh, you ask, when you go to the Supreme Court, you ask for directions. You don't just ask the judge to make the decision. The judge is there, the judge, who's going... If you can't make a decision with your, 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 um, the person you're having the argument with, that's the idea of the judge. He's going to make the decision for you. But if you've got a really strong ar- argument, you can go into the Supreme Court and you can ask for directions. So basically, if you want to go to the Supreme Court, you can go to the Supreme Court and you want this argument directed into an equity court. And if you do it properly, the judge will, it costs you money, but the judge will say, well, you know your law would direct it. But as soon as you can't direct the law, then the judge is going to make the decision for you. Do you understand that? <coughs> so if anyone takes you on, you've got to be able to know how to speak all your way. The more you know your history of the law, the more powerful you become. It's so important when you go in the past. What came out of the House of Commons uh, in 1901 was this thing called uh, Federation. I'll put it, and I'm going to put this real circle, because this is a whole different world when it comes to Federation. So out of Federation, the Commonwealth had all these governments, Oz, you know, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, Quite a few. But yeah, just for the Australian government, we, we've got this uh, federal government. We, we've just got its House of Representatives and um, Senate, but also we've got all these big govs, Queensland govs, New South Wales, all right, South Oz, WA. And again, they've got their own parliaments, you know. 
uh, Victoria is called the upper house. Lower house. <coughs> What's really interesting when they set up the Australian constitution compared to the others, because they, they really... The Australian constitution is the youngest one on the, on the planet. They... Um, they, they really learned a lot from the way they set up the American Constitution and also the Canadian one. So with the Australian government, what's really unique about Australian government is that when uh, the federal government passed law, they got a Governor-General. Basically, when he stamps it, it becomes law. So there's a lot of laws that's going around right now that hasn't been ascended by the Crown. They're not actually laws. Very interesting. Native title consent determination is one of them. I want to speak a bit more about that because I spent a lot of time in the Aboriginal communities. Uh, I'll, I'll draw the Aboriginal history in this. It's very fascinating. But they, they, they got, the federal law's got a, a Governor-General. Well, they, all these states have got governors. All right. Basically, the governors have got three offices. One of them is to deal with the state legislation. They, they've got another office which goes straight to the Crown. They get instructions straight from the Crown. And there's another office, I'm not too sure what it is, but the way they set it up, the mining company wants to come in and, and they can go straight to the Governor's office and get a, a lease through the Governor's office before, they goes, before it gets passed through a bill. That's the way it's called, parte soleil. Because you've got to understand, when the Australian Federation was set up, the old House of Lords were the ones that set this up. They know all this sort of stuff, you know. They still have a lot of power in Australia when it comes to the stuff you don't understand. Because this is all common law knowledge. <coughs> when it, and the big difference between the two, when it comes to the House of Lords, they, they work under something called custom law. Or custom and usage law. Has anyone heard of that law? Custom and usage law? No, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, 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 if you want to protect your assets, get custom and usage law. If you don't know it exists, then you're going, you're going mate, you're getting bounced around, all right? These people work under statute law. It's a big difference to a House of Lords using custom law and the House of Commons using statute law to keep the Commons intact. As soon as you've got a statute law, it's in statute. Quite often when you go in a place like Bendigo and Ballarat, there's a lot of statutes. <laughs> All right? When it comes to statute law, this is where the God Apollo kind of works along. The God of Light, it's all about legislation. You keep the thing in statutes. <clears throat> and basically that's where your parliament and all your bureaucracy comes under statute law because you're a, a citizen of the state. All right? Uh, when it comes to custom and usage law, you're not a citizen, you're a subject of the Crown. There's a bit of a difference between a subject and a Crown and a citizen. All right? I want to kind of... Well, technically, when you're in Australia, you're a subject of the Queen. If you're an Aussie, you can call this in. I'm a subject of the Queen. If you're a British citizen, you can be a subject of the Crown. But under here, you, under statute law, you've got the word citizen. You do not see the word citizen in the Australian Constitution, Commonwealth Constitution. You see subject of the Crown, but you not, do not see the word citizen. So here they are, you know, you're a good Victorian citizen. What does the word citizen mean? It actually comes from um, a Greek term, if you're in the town of Athens and you like the financial platform of the city of Athens, Athens and you would be part of that city finances, you become a citizen, that's what it means. If you want to be part of Athens and you didn't want to be in that town because of the finances, then they'll call you an idiot. <laughs> and that's what the word idiot means, it means private citizen. So if you call yourself an Australian citizen, or a Victorian citizen, you want the money, <laughs> we want the cash, all right? You're giving consent, you want to play the game. So if you like the game, you get the cash and someone comes on and they start jumping on you, it's too bad, too sad because you want the cash. <clears throat> but if you want to 
if someone starts hitting you out of here and you want to get out of that and understand your rights against the world of the citizen corporate world, you've got to know a different language, you know? So what's happened with the uh, Victorian government, all these governments right now, somewhere along the line, um, they become corporate bodies, huh? Corporations. They got ABNs on them. <coughs> how does the government get a corporate? How does the government get an ABN? Basically, they've overstretched themselves. They borrow money they can't pay back. So, when they become a corporation with an ABN, technically by law. They're in insolvent circumstances. They're in debt. They can't pay it off in one long cash payment, so they can pay it off in increments. So it's when mining company like um, all this gas factoring stuff, which comes out of Citibank, basically, they're saying, well, this is the way you're paying off the debt, <laughs> fella. You borrowed all this money building all these big highways and all these infrastructure, Borrowing billions and billions of dollars for infrastructure. No one asks who they're actually buying the money from. No one's asking who's holding the debt. We just keep borrowing. Next thing you know, they've got an ABN. Someone's got to pay off the ABN. Who's paying off the ABN? The citizens of the, the state government. Your kids, even kids who are not even been born yet, are going to get start paying off this debt for a tunnel that might have gone through Eastlink. So who's making these decisions, you know? So all of a sudden, these guys, these corporations, city banks the worst for them, they want their money back. And so the way they bring their money back is we no longer got um, public servants, we've got all these outsourced administration companies or corporations playing government policy on us. One of them is local government, right? <clears throat> you go into local government, it's, the local government's a corporation. They've got a CEO running the local government. Does anyone vote for a CEO? It's not democracy, is it? So it's getting to the stage now we vote for the councillors. And in the old days when we had God Save the Queen, you know, I remember when, we, when I was a kid, we used to go to school and we used to sing God Save the Queen. As a kid, we had free schooling. <laughs> we had our own council. You pay your rates to the council, the council had their own clerks. So we're counting their own money, it goes back into the community. Because we voted for a, a, a democracy, dem democratically, we voted for our own councillors. They had a mayor, they had their own clerk office. Everything was counted within the rule of law of the Crown. But now we've got CEOs counting the money for us. You got these CEOs. He doesn't answer to a board. Of, he doesn't answer to our captain. He answers to a board of directors. So all these CEOs, we follow the paper. The CEO, the board of directors, the CEO answer to are in Barcelona. This is how they're doing the new world order stuff. You know, you're supposed to pay. And this is what I, I had an issue with uh, QC. I'm, I'm paying land tax to the crown through the government to collect the land tax for the Crown, but how come this CEO's collecting me land tax? How come I'm paying land tax to a CEO? Big question in law, isn't it? I've put it to the CEO in my account. They don't, when I'm talking to this, they're looking at me, they don't know what the hell I'm talking about. They are seriously uneducated people, mate. They do not know, because they've had an education away from all this. They, people think the law doesn't exist. No, the law exists, mate. You're just ignorant of the law. That's the problem. <clears throat> it's really mind-boggling. So I'm, I'm, I'm just a lay learner. I'm talking to people in law. My friend Jeff, he knows this. And when we been went in the county court. Man, it was a joke, that was. Even the, even the county court judges didn't even know what the hell I was talking about. It's all been administrated, see. I went to the county court because I wanted to get out of here and I wanted to get in the Supreme Court. Because this is the fact that when it comes to um, these CEOs, you've got to know that these guys have got a licence to operate. 
hair spell license, my spell's not too good. Basically, they're an outsource. Any CEO is an outsource administration. Two things an administration needs to do, they've got to keep the finances turning around and they've got to keep the administration working. No finances, no administration. They're, they're on a spiral because all these CEOs and our councils are competing with each other. This is where this competition is good for us. It's not, it's killing us. So even now, our CEO, we're all live up in the Lauren Shire Council. They won't admit it, but they're broke. They're just given some sort of nice policy where you have their struggling or whatever, but they're broke. So the next Shire Council next to us are broke also, and they've got to compete with each other. They get tourism and all that. You know, it's not good, is it? But they've got a licence, outsourced licence, to be really aggressive on you. So if you step outside of their charter of business, they throw fines on you, you know. As soon as you get a fine, there are people paying because they've got a fancy letterhead and people are paying it off. But I, I, well, Jeff, Jeff knows me and Jeff knows, I took that licence to court because their licence is interfering with my right. And that's the big thing. If you want to take on the corporations, you've got to know what is right. If you don't know what is right, for Christ's sake, don't take them on, because this is a big machine, man. This is aggressive. They've got backup. And it's quick. All right? And there's a, there's a form of efficiency about that. They're quick. Bang, bang. And they really just brain muddle people. And that's how they're winning a lot. They're exhausting people before you even get a chance to speak law. Yeah, I'll get you. It's my Jeff here, he's my mentor. He keeps, he'll tell me. So, can you see how this is all playing out? When it comes to custom and usage law, what is this? So, when um, John uh, came up and he said about this rooted rule, I said, for Christ's sake, don't start a business up that's going to get sucked up into this world because you're never going to come out of it. But if you want to start something, because one of the things that this whole aspect of customer usage or the way this thing grows, customer usage, and it will grow into the future, this thing's going bankrupt, people. It is dying. If you've got a society with kids committing suicide, it's not healthy. It doesn't matter what, how they try and polish it up. All right? Custom and usage law. This is the one key word that it keeps uh, evolving on. It's called innovations. If you've got an innovation, you understand how custom and usage law works. <coughs> and that's what I'm sharing this with our, the Root at Raw crew. We've got this great idea. Uh, my mate Jeff here, who, um, We've been talking this about 10 years. We've got all the great knowledge of how this law works, custom and usage, but one thing Read It Raw's got, it's got a product, food. We all need food. We all need health, and we all need to be educated about this, all right? So one of the things, if you've got an innovation about healthy food, uh, education, and also cultivation of land, I know, some, I've got, I know people have got some land issues, uh, that comes under something called Lex Locke. It's a doctrine of law, Lex Locke. Basically, Lex Locke was what created our municipal councils in the first place. <coughs> you don't need money, right? All you need out of Lex Locke is uh, health. If you can prove that you're going to do health, uh, document which comes under education and also cultivation of land. If you create a charter of, of an idea, innovation, business under those three things, you're allowed to do that. Well, it's called a right of assembly. We've got an assembly here. We can come in an agreement. If we come out under the Lex Locke and we've got these three documents, we're allowed to do that. And that's what we're doing at Rudit Raw. We come right now, we're brainstorming, we've got this product, how do we share it? And that's, but we want to do something that's really integral and healthy. 
without getting caught up into this world of bankruptcy. Why start something healthy when all these CEOs just want a vampire on it so they can try and cover their last couple of days? You know, it's like a bunch of seagulls around a sandwich right now. You know, why would you get? Why would you start something fresh? So this whole bureaucracy just try and suck it dry. You know, so we got the smarts. We don't have to do that. <coughs> so where do you actually go for it? There's, an, there's interesting people that come out of here because these CEOs are really, they really haven't got much authority. They've got a lot of intimidation and you know, they've got a bunch of uh, trade lawyers and all that and go through to the government to justify their statute laws and legislation and all that. But there's other really interesting people around here. It's called uh, Notary Publics. Has anyone heard of notary publics? Yeah, very, there's not too many, I think there's only about six in Victoria. They're trying to, they're, this corporate government world are trying to cut out the notary publics. Not all of them, Jim. Well, even if they're notary publics, they, like, we, we're working through notary public and knows how to work through the rule of law, right? The big difference between the two, what creates federation and what creates this whole bureaucracy is this thing called uh, registration. You know, are you registered? <laughs> registration. You can't do business unless you've got a registration. Basically, you can't do business unless we get an insurance company to throw all our liens on you. So if you're not registered, you can't do trade, as far as they're concerned, you know? And so it's all this bluff. But the Notary Public, they don't work on registration, they work on um, record. There's a big difference between record and registration. If you get something, if you've got an idea, or even if you're in an existing business right now, and a lot of these license, all these CEOs and all these lawyers, they have to have a license, they have to re be registered, and they have to be under a statute law of one of these governments to actually work in their courts. So out of the Vic courts, you know, they've got the two, well, they could call it a magistrate, but technically the magistrate's a commission, it's not a court. <laughs> if you get caught up in the magistrate courts, uh, you got arrested, you dickhead, you know. <laughs> you got caught. So the magistrate just deals with penalties and fines. It doesn't deal with law. We've experienced that. If you put the law down, you put common law down, the magistrate, they're actually called inferior courts. So they don't deal with law. So don't take a law issue into a magistrate court because you just don't know. They've got, they've got another court, magistrate. They've got another court, like the county court. And basically, the county courts still under um, state legislation, and the county court deals with just say you had a, a registered business doing building or something like that, and you, and you clash with another registered builder. So they're working under state legislation, it's like just two clashes of state legislation. Well, that's what the county court deals with, you know. Uh, it's mainly about contracts, straighten out contracts. But if you, if you have a right and you want to take any state legislation, one of the things I'm at process right now, I'm taking this CEO on about his right to take my land tax. All right? Because my, my, on your, on your um, land title, this is a friend of mine from Queensland, you look at your state of fee simple, it's got the actual land title of the lion and the unicorn on it, right? There's a big difference between when you see that seal of the lion and the unicorn compared to the seal of the Australian government of the emu and the, kangar and the kangaroo. Two different seals means two different laws. By law, I'm a tenant in common, a state of fee simple, tenant in common, you buy the land off the crown through the church. Because you have a look at the land it's, it's off the parish. You don't buy it off the government. The government's there to administrate the affairs of the Crown. 
your title to custom law is that you are, in a, you are a subject of the Crown and you are a state of fee simple. You're a tenant in common, a state of fee simple. There'll be a volume number, a folio number up the top right hand corner. And there's a parish there. You actually buy the land through the church, to the Crown. That's law. But if you get a modern day uh, land tenure now, they've got rid of the Crown. They've got the uh, Lotus Side Council, and this is fraud. They put a lien on it, they're they're really trying to cover up the truth here because they're giving you a different documentation, a different letterhead. But the volume and file number is always up the top corner. That's telling that your land is on record. It's not registered. They're telling you you own the land. You do not own the land, you're what they call a tenant in common. As soon as you call, you say you own the land, then all their possessive and their rights come in. You do not own the land. You're a tenant in common. What's the value of that? (coughs) If you understand that you're a tenant in common, under that you have something called a right in rem. Big key word. I suggest anyone get up on the internet and look at right in rem. If you've got any thing that's outside of you, like a house, anything that's yours, you have a right in rem to take on the licence. You just don't go out the judge and say, I've got a right. <laughs> you've got to explain your right. You've got to explain the doctrine of your right. Did I have a right in rem? Because while you're a tenant in common, you also have a right, what they call a right in res. And the right in res is into the Crown. The Crown reserves the right to hear that argument into their court. Do not hang, do not bag the Queen. If there's no King, there's no common law. If there's no Queen, there's no common law. Basically, it was King Henry II who started it. He was the one who created the seal, the, the, the royal writs. He was the one who created the royal court. He had to, uh, there's that story about the murder of um, Beckett, the Archbishop Beckett, there's a bit of a story there. Because all the, ha- all the land was under the ecclesiastical church's authority. And when King Henry II um, wanted to take royal authority away from the church, Beckett would not resign that office. So the story is that Beckett got killed at the, while he was praying in Canterbury Cathedral. When he got killed, he gave the right to start the royal courts. And it started kind of like a temporary court away from the ecclesiastical spiritual. But when he created the royal courts, he created the royal writ. And what the royal writ means, if you have an argument, you've got to write down the argument into their courts. All right? Does that make sense? If you've got an argument, you just don't go to judge, you've got to fight. You've got to write down your argument, you've got to explain your law, write down to that, you've got the principles of where your rights are, and you have, a, and then you go through a um, a court. What's it called? A Supreme Court pro thonitary office fees, right? So they're not cheap. Uh, you know, you can pay if you've got an argument that you want to take your right up against a, a corporate license. Basically, you go into this uh, pro thonitary office, and you might have to pay, like in this case, nine hundred and thirty-eight bucks for one of their uh, officers to read the argument and if it's not a valid argument you don't get your money back <laughs> but if it is a valid argument what happens is they'll put the stamp they put their seal stamp on it then they put it to the CEO and then that CEO will have to answer your writ in their court that's when they start shooting themselves All right, you've got to know the process because if I write a letter of disgruntled, you know, Ross David Drake, that I'm really upset, and I, you know, it's, it's no power to him. But if you, if you write a letter through this process and there's a stamp on it, Supreme Court stamp, and it goes and then, then they've been summoned to answer their licence to a court, they won't go there. Because these guys, these CEOs, no, they're just, they're on a suicide mission like the rest of us. But they're getting a quarter of a million dollars a year floating while the rest of it. They know. Huh? 
Yeah. They know. <coughs> How does this custom law survive? Is that um, one of the things through innovation is that they need precedence, you know? Australia as a, as a constitution is a judge, right, <coughs> judge made rule. The monarchy has been going for about 1500 years. Why has this one country, one monarchy out of all the countries around the world, this one of England managed to conquer one in four people at its peak, although it's got, it's, it's got bastardised into this commercial fiat world, which is not bills of exchange equity, as I'll explain in the next section. How do they actually do this? It was through stamp duty. The most powerful thing they had was stamp, postage stamp. If they were going from England to India to Australia, New Zealand, at the old days before there was bills of exchange, it was going through the post office. Postage stamps. So if you pay, what's it, 70 cents now a stamp, it has a right of passage to your neighbour, hasn't it? So it's the same here. If you pay 900 bucks for a stamp, it has a right of passage for it to be heard. If you get a, a, a stamp with a magistrate court and you're summoned that stamp on the court, if you, don't, if you refuse that stamp, then the cop is going to jump you in there for um, you know, not turning up the court. <coughs> stamp, stamp duty, very powerful. When you pay for your land and you pay stamp duty on your estate of fee simple, the stamp duty is going to the Crown. It's not going to the, the government. That's why the government wants to try and knock off stamp duty. But the one thing that this monarchy can do for it to keep growing is that it can learn from its subjects about what is right through law through this sort of process. If you've got a writ and you want to write out what is right, and if you've got a Lex Locke idea and you want to write up this Lex Locke idea into a writ, and I'll explain this in the next bit, you can go through the royal courts. You go in the Supreme Court, but if you've got a great idea in the Supreme Court, you can take them from that Supreme Court and you can go straight into an equity division or you can go into the church if you write it up properly. Or you can take this idea and bring these guys in or you can go up into here. It's how you direct your knowledge of law. If you've got an idea if you create a new community against this CEO, they're not going to... They're, they're dumb people. They don't know. <laughs> they really don't know. Because as a CEO, their job is just to collect the debt for the ABN. They're making sure chief executive officer is very militant, isn't it? His job is to make sure that ABN debt's getting promised. He doesn't... It's, it's a corporation. It's not a community. He doesn't work around it. They say community letterheads and that. That's not his agenda. It's the councillor's job to work for the, see, uh, the community. Not his. It's getting to a stage up in Bendigo right now. The mayor of Bendigo, I heard on the radio, I was going, yeah, man. Because he's got control of the ledger book. That's the power play. Doesn't matter what great idea you've got, who's ever got control of the ledger book, it's got the power. It's got the pen. These guys know it. That's what you're up against. <coughs> when it comes down, it's all down to finances, yeah? So, this is making sense. You can see how the plate is, right? Uh, what's really interesting is this... Uh, one of the things you've got to understand about how this works compared to federation... I want to explain a bit about American Civil War here because that's where Federation started. It's really interesting. Uh, a good movie that you can watch is um, Django Unchained. Anyone seen that? Yeah, pretty violent. Don't watch it because of the violence. <laughs> I just want to explain the periodic setting of it. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was a plantation owner. He was working under equity and property. All right? Uh, everyone on that plantation was his property. Even his own sister, who watched the movie. His closest mate, he had a lawyer. He had a bunch of white fellows working for him. They were getting a bit of cash, but he had all these Negro slaves, and they were slaves. They weren't getting nothing, right? 
because they were under his property, equity and property. He had a custom and usage law. The whole of America, and indeed Australia, was set up on custom and usage law. Uh, and in Australia, we didn't have Negro slaves, we had convicts, which was practically the same sort of um, equity balance, all right? At the same time, you've got to know that information was a lot slower. It was all going through stamp. If you had equity in property, you were educated. They were the upper class and there was no lower class. There was no middle class in those days, all right? You've got to really know that. This is what Australia was first colonised on. One of the things that they had... I'll just go and draw a bit. What Leonardo DiCaprio would have had in those days, indeed the whole House of Lords, to create his own ledger book with all that property right, he would have had a, a herald of coat of arms. There was no straw man in those days. You were either have or they have nots. The language they were using was not the same language they're doing now. So you cannot judge their history with your modern knowledge. It does not doesn't work. He had a coat of arms. <coughs> From that coat of arms, he had his own ledger book. He had his own estate and all that land and everyone was uh, working on him because he was in the world of equity. When Australia got first colonised, Governor Philip, was it, was it Philip was the first governor? <coughs> He had a commission because it basically was a penal colony. When the Australian uh, Supreme Court came in, there was only two courts in the Australian. The first court system was the Court of Common Law and the Court of Equity. There was no other courts. It was just two courts. Equity Court is a very... And I'll explain Equity Court in the last business. But what he had as a coat of arms, he had all that property which we might call slavery, yeah? Slave. So only very few people had the wealth. Um, initially, when they had the War of Independence, and, and War of Independence was over, actually over stamp duty. It was over, over actually when they buying land. And um, they wanted the stamp duty to stay in America instead of that stamp duty going back into England. That was the main issue what the War of Independence was about. Because you can only have land and equity if you had a herald, a coat of arms, because you can show where your hereditary rights was to further the British Empire. Well, it wasn't an empire in those days. Well, it was the, um, this is all under the Bills of Exchange Act. But when the uh, American Ind War of Independence, one of the amendments to the Constitution was the right to bear arms. All right? It wasn't a right to pick up guns, it was a right to bear their own coat of arms. Because once they've got their own coat of arms, then they can get into the equity game. That's the real reason of the American War of Independence. The reason why I'm putting up, because Jeff, my friend Jeff here over breaks, he's got some books on coat of arms. It's really, if you want to get out of this commercial realm of debt, you've got to understand your hereditary rights to open up this whole common law stuff. If you don't know your hereditary rights, if you don't understand how the Supreme Court operates, if you don't know your storyline goes back in there, you are not going to have a strong story to go through the courts. You have to know your rights. You have to know your history. And you've got to show that judge and you've got to be present with that knowledge. Because it's just one thing to write it, but you've just got to stand strong with that knowledge. I'm not giving consent here. Because as soon as you don't know, you, and you give consent through your lack of knowledge, you lose. All right? You're going up the court. There's only one winner in the court. They don't hang out tissues for losers, all right? <clears throat> so if you're going to go into court, make sure you're going to have a, your best swing, you know what I mean? So one of the things that we want to present down for me and Jeff, uh, and we're talking this with uh, our rooted royal friends, we're talking about our seals. You know, maybe uh, Dave can explain that in later. We want to set up rooted raw. We need to create our own ledger book. We need to create our own relationships with other people in the future under a coat of arms. Still exists in law. 
you, you have a look up the top there, there's a coat of arms up the top there. Represents the charter of this church. Right? Very powerful, isn't it? So whenever you, you look around town, have a look at the symbols, the coat of arms, because that coat of arms represents the charter of their administration. Right? That's what you've got to hit. And then when you look at that charter of administration, find out if it's been registered or on Rock Eld. You got it because there's something in law called first in time, first in law. The older the law, older you have in time, the more powerful it is in law. Right? What came out of the coat of arms? So next thing you know, in America, after the War of Independence, basically there was, you know, thirteen confederacies. You know, and each confederacy had a grant from the crown to do their own seal of jurisdiction. So, you know, if you, if you were in, uh, what was it, uh, just say Virginia, everyone who wanted to become under the charter of Virginia, they were doing great char- charters under the Virginia trade. Next one might have been Tennessee, all these. And they were doing, that was what Confederacy was all about. It's, it's the same... We've, um, when Victoria had its own colonial laws and New South Wales had the colonial laws they had their own uh, jurisdiction, their own Supreme Court how to run that community but when um, you, Lincoln, another good movie to watch with Daniel Day Lewis in it they, they wanted to create one central bank basically to absolve all those 13 smaller colonies into one Federation. Uh, that's what's the main thing. They want to create a central bank. It was not about freeing the American sli- Negroes from slavery. That was not the issue because it was a good Christian heart thing. It was not the issue. The real issue is, and it was interesting when you're watching in that movie with Lincoln, he was a Republican. Uh, they, were, he, they won the first term, they were coming up for the second term of election. The Republican, the, the North, was starting to win the war, but basically because they had a lot of Negro, ex-Negro slaves fighting for the North. Right? And so, but Abraham Lincoln wanted to um, abolish the slave trade. You know? And it was a big, it was good and interesting movement. So why, why would we need to free the, American, the, the slaves? You know? We're going to win the war. These guys are kind of exhausted. Even his own republic couldn't understand why you're trying to pass, I think it's the 13th Amendment, why are you trying to pass this amendment to free the American slaves? And he, and he basically said it was all about property law. It wasn't about freeing the Negroes from slavery. It was, it was all about property law. That why the Negro slaves were under that property of, uh, of law, of coat of arms of that plantation owner, of the legible, he said, while they're declaring war, they are free. But if they sue for peace and they go back to the old property laws of the colonies and they become state, that means all the Negroes' slaves will end up going back to slaves under old property law. So he had to change the property law to free the American slaves. <coughs> so to free the American slaves from the old property law, he had to create a new property law. And that was what the war was about, because he was going against the law doing this. That's what the war was about. A lot of these judges saying, you're going against the law, trying to free people from their own property, the coat of arms from their own property rights. But they, they passed it through the amendment, because what he'd done, he created the, United, the seal of the United States of America. So next thing you know, the USA took a precedent of law, property law, over all these people who were slaves under the coat of arms. So this is what happens is the American Negroes are saying, oh great, we're no longer slaves. We don't, because this, what ha- happened under the um, USA, this is when they started to ask for registration and licence. Because before that, under equity, you didn't need to register or license equity. You were under record through bills of exchange. You didn't need to be registered or have license to move money. 
They already had it through the old coat of arms, Ecuador. Under the USA, if you wanted the greenback money, the greenback dollar, which is basically paying off the war debt, <laughs> you need to be registered or licensed to get the greenback cash. Well, the American Negro slaves, that's great. <laughs> we'll get licensed. But for the white fellas, wait a sec, now we're getting enslaved. They were free under there, but now the white fellas getting enslaved. First thing the USA done, they went out and they gave, they went out and um, gave free postal service. Oh, this is nice. We're getting free postage away from the bills of exchange stamp duty. Free postage. And the reason why they want free postage because they want to know where you were. It was the first censorship. As soon as you receive the postage, the free postage and you want to be registered and licensed for the greenback dollar of federation, this is where the straw man came in. The straw man name. You agreed with an artificial feet currency that's there to design war. It's got nothing to do with the English pound. This is the American greenback. It's a whole different registration of finances. If you accept the war dollar money, you're a straw man. How do you get out of that into your coat of arms? Because if you're not the straw man, if you're not an artificial person paying off the debt cycle, then who are you? I'm the judge. Who are you? If you don't know, get paid. You haven't, if you're not, because what they call under the straw man, registration, license and straw man, the way they really uh, manage all that through uh, contract law, As soon as, you, as soon as you draw up a contract and you're in your own, you, you become a person. Right? Uh, so we're, we're either a citizen or a person or a subject of the Crown. When you look at the start of the Constitution, it says, we the people of the Constitution. Are you a consumer? Who the hell are you? It's very confusing, aren't you? You've got so many labels being put on you. If you go into magistrate court, they say, did you bring your person into court? Because the magistrate just deals with contract law. So no, I haven't brought my person in, but I've got my coat of arms. <laughs> I've got a character with a hereditary right. Basically, this contract's got nothing to do with me because I've got, I'm, I'm allowed to go to another court. I've got an equity court to explain that this person's trying to suck me into a contract that's not mine. The term of that is called, uh, if you understand that, there's two ways you can do that. If you've got your coat of arms before someone puts a contract on you, by law, this is a key thing to read up, it's called an abatement. Abatement. It's very, very good to know how to prevent yourself before someone comes in and attacks you. Abatement's an old um, court of chivalry term when you put the shield up. You know, this is my coat of arms, this is my shield. You have got no right to pass. That's called an abatement. If they do suck you in through some sort of like a um, parking fine or something like that, and if you want to get out of that parking fine into an equity court, it's called a, a demure. It's a, it's a demure. It's a woman's right to prerogative. A, a woman's demure. Her right to change her mind. <laughs> Very two important things, abatement and demurs. If someone sucks you in, you don't know, and you realise this is, I've got another court, I don't want to go to the magistrate court, I've got a writ of demure. I had a mate, he'd done this, I ripped, ripped one up for a mate in uh, Gosford actually. Council was jumping on him, stressing. Um, and I said, oh, give, him, give him the writ of demure, mate. That you, and basically what the demure is, you know, when you go into court, don't go in with a fight. You've got to go in there with good honour. You've got to understand where these guys are coming from. So basically, say, look, I understand where you're coming from, Mr CEO. You're on a, you've got a licence and you've got to suck money out of the public to maintain your half a million dollar lifestyle. That's fine. You've got a contract to do that. That's right. But the demure is, that's got nothing to do with me. I've got another right. You can, you can, do your, you can suck up the people who don't know. That's fine. As soon as you've got a demur, I understand the bluff. And then you've got to explain your, your right through the demur into an equity court. 
And I'll explain a bit how the equity courts work later on. All right. Now, I want to say something really powerful when it comes to this world. And I've, to... I've spent a lot of time talking. When I show these drawings to a lot of Aboriginal elders, they're like, cool, man, you know. <laughs> Indigenous people, well, I experienced. I find when I talk to Indigenous people about law, extremely deep and intelligent people. Like, they're really focused, you know. Why? Because they're trying to protect this land, man, you know. They don't want to get rich. They don't want big boats. They don't want, they're just trying to maintain the health and the song of this, of this land. They've been doing it for 40,000 years. They want to do it for another 40,000. So when a bunch of white fellas come in with their colonisation, we're doing it good for you, you know. And they're like, oh, brother, you know. They're really struggling. Few, I must say, there's a, there's a few uh, indigenous people selling out. They like the bucks and they're signing contracts at the expense of the elders. Because <coughs> the, elders, the elders are just off the land. They don't understand the state of fee simple. They don't understand this whole British monarchy, arbitrary, whatever. You know, to them, like, man, that's weird dreaming, do you know what I mean? They just want to sit on the land and be with the land. But they're not fool enough just to ignore this. They have to, um, from my understanding, the elders want to know the truth so they can navigate through this crap. You know what I mean? So when I showed them all this, they go, oh, thanks, bro, because it's like a dot painting for them, you know? They can see their reference points. So I just want to explain a bit about uh, Marbo. What's the, how, am I, how am I going for time here, John? All right, good. This is very important to know when it comes to Lex Locke. Right. Read it raw. Uh, ethos. Not talking morals, because morals work around the Ten Commandments. Well, morals work around the construction of law, the doctrines. But when it comes to the ethos, it's more of a spiritual plane, all right? And there is a spirit plane within the law if you can approach it with good spirit. If you just want your, your compensation or you want your justice and you just want it right, it's kind of like male hit, hitting male hit. There's no grace in it. So there's a way, there's a way for this uh, Lex Locke to enter Aboriginal commun uh, communities. Uh, the history of it is um, good movie to watch. Uh, it's called Amazing Grace. Anyone seen that movie, Amazing Grace? Yeah, beautiful movie. It's about um, William Wilberforce. He was the one who brought the anti-slavery movement into the uh, House of Commons in England. He, he was the one who stopped slavery. It took him about 15 years. Uh, really good movie to watch to see that periodic time and the struggle that was on, you know. So sure, you had this really... And at the time, England was totally ruled by Freemasons, right? There's a difference between a Freemason and a Christian. It was a Christian movement that moved that anti-slavery movement. It was a Christian movement who brought in a native title doctrine for the Aboriginal people of this land. And I want to explain that. Uh, during the Seven Year War, the war between France and England, mainly to have the right to colonise Canada, King George III, um, where for the American, for the Canadian Native uh, Indians, because when they first colonised, it was a prerogative of the Crown to offer the, ha the Indigenous people of Canada had their happy hunting ground rights. That's how it started, the happy hunting ground rights. I can't give the right date. I think it was about 1793, actually. Hunting. Happy hunting ground, as a prerogative of the Crown. As, as, a, as a prerogative of the Crown, that's not statute law. It didn't go through the House of Commons. And the monarchy is saying they've got a prerogative. In 1823, there was a Supreme Court judge called Marshall in uh, America. Beautiful man, if you ever read his stuff. 
done a lot for the Indigenous people. He was the one who got the happy hunting ground and he actually brought it down into the native title doctrine. It got passed through the American law in 1823. This was a president. As soon as the law goes through a Supreme Court in America, it becomes a life for all the Supreme Courts right around the Commonwealth. This is the beauty. If we do something here in Australia for the Supreme Court in Melbourne, a Lex Locky thing through the Supreme Court in Melbourne, as a rule of law, not a statute, as a rule of law, that doctrine can be picked up right around the Commonwealth. That's how the English monarchy moves for 1,500 years through Stan. 1823. Uh, when Australia was getting colonised, 1770s, would have been around about this time, because you've got to also know that information was really slow in those days, so if something happened in Australia, it would have to have been captured, someone would have had to write it down, document it, put it on a boat, it would have got sold, and if it was a really quick check to England, it would have took six weeks. They would have got the information, talked around the crew, rewrite the letter, put a stamp, go back down, it would have taken you know, probably six months before information from there came back and revert back. That's how slow information was back in those days. So when the, uh, the Privy Council, not the merchant bankers of the Admiralty, who was raping and pillaging and shooting Indigenous people here, but when the Privy Council heard that uh, the Tasmanian Aboriginals were extinct, because they were shooting them for sport, basically, hunting them for sport, it was really embarrassing for the, the Christian Privy Council. This is not us. So what the Privy Council done, through, through someone called Earl Grey, he was the champion of this. Cup of tea, Earl Grey. He was the one who brought native title into the Australian Parliament in about 1844. I think it was about 1840s. Um, all kind of backed up by the Quakers and the Christian movements. No Freemasons involved in here, right? Freemasons don't want... I'll explain a bit about Freemasons in the next section. It was Christian. And I want to emphasise that while we're in a Christian church. It wasn't Jewish, it wasn't Islamic. It was Christian. <coughs> Native title. In law. Of land. Not law of the sea. Admiralty works off the law of the sea. I want to explain that in the next section. The difference between the law of the sea and the law of the land. When you buy your, buy your state of fee simple, you are buying land through the parish, the church, parish. You do not buy it off the crown through the Admiralty. If you, basically how it works, if you were, you got land, you can do anything on your land, but as soon as you step out of your land and you want to go into a world of commerce, you enter into the law of the sea. <laughs> that's the difference. That's when you've got to register because you want a bit of the money, see. And that's how the Admiralty works. While you're on the land, you can do what you want. Under the parish, you can create your own church, create your own college on the world of the land. But when you step out and you want to deal with other people, you enter the law of the sea. And there's a big, big war out there because God knows which Hamilton is running through Australia right now. It ain't the British Hamilton, I'm going to show you. And the way they're moving money into China right now, I don't think the American Hamilton is working too well at present. I'll explain that in the next court. But I just want to say that native title is the law of the land. It's not the law of the sea. It's, a, it's an ecclesiastical issue. I'm saying to the Indigenous elders, if they actually want a treaty with the Crown, they have to go through the church. It's not Parliament's job to do treaties with the Indigenous people when it comes to world, law of the land. State government, just our government only deals with revenue, commerce, revenue and war. It does not deal with treaties, technically. <coughs> These all happened in 1844. No Indigenous people could read this in these days. 
Only very few white people had access because most of them were um, convicts. Pretty how world out there, you know. So only a few, very few people had knowledge of this information. A couple of things that really started up, stuffed up native title. This is my term. One thing was uh, Morse code. That came in. Next thing, our information got really quicker. All right. Another thing that really stuffed it up was gold in their grounds. Bugger the law, there's gold. <laughs> Right? The Aboriginals, especially in Victoria, had no, no hope when people found gold. The gold fever came in. Another thing that really stuffed up the Indigenous people was um, Darwin's theory of evolution. Right? Basically, I think it was a white paper that got passed through Parliament that the strongest will survive. You know, indigenous people didn't have a chance when it was gold in the ground in the theories of evolution. Uh, and Basically what was happening at that time, uh, gold was coming out, there was all this opium coming out of uh, China, uh, and what was also coming out of, uh, uh, out of China back in England was all these esoteric books on uh, chakras and all this Asian influence. Um, when they brought the gold back from Victoria, very Ballarat, what happened in England, they changed, because at this time, when uh, the Commonwealth was leading, you had your coat of arms, land was the land-backed asset. When they brought gold out of California and England and, and out of South Africa with roads and all that, they were bringing all these resources back into England. And what happened, they changed the currency from land back to um, resource currency, gold-backed currency. And that gave power to the Freemasons because they were the ones investing for foreign investment. This is all trade. The Freemasons had gold, they had, had dope, um, opium, they had all this esoteric knowledge coming out of the Asia. Next thing you know, all this occult magic coming out of Madame Zvarsky and you know, everyone's getting all super psychic power and all this sort of stuff. You know, it was very demonic. Killing Aboriginals at the time, going to church Sunday, da, da. This, this was what was the basis of our country. It wasn't Christian, it was Freemasonry. What are the free, and when you go to Freemasons and you open up the scriptures, I won't go to it, but basically 1066 when they uh, opened up Solomon's Temple, uh, uh, they were the Knights Templars, they found this, uh, open up the scriptures in there of how to build temples. And you know what the magical thing was that they found in that scripture? It was the plumb bolt. <coughs> oh, how do you use the plumb bolt? And next thing you know, what happened in Europe all these amazing cathedrals coming out, they'll start to be able to measure gravity. Right? And when they were measuring gravity and all these privatised lords at the time were building all these cathedrals, they were starting to build banks from one cathedral to another. And that was the start of the banking industry, from the plumb bolt. <laughs> That's Freemasonry, because their God's the God of the architect. So when you go out here and you see all these streets and you see all these buildings, totally built by uh, Freemasons, one built by Christians. Right? You've got to understand who you're shaking hands with. Right? You go into that court, you've got to know who his God is if you want to speak law. <coughs> Fascinating, isn't it? But this native title, doctrine, law of the land, is very Christian. It had nothing to do with building cities. So that went to sleep. And then um, no one knew about it until Eddie Marbo, 1992, the Queensland government said he had no right to his land. He said, I have got a lot of right, brother. I've got heritage. All right. It was uh, James Cook University who took that argument up. There was a really good law professor named uh, Henry Reynolds. I suggest read his stuff. I know a lot of law historians don't like Henry Reynolds because he's got a black history instead of a white history. He, he'll tell you the difference between Freemasonry and the truth. <laughs> so it's not, not liked. But he brought, basically, it was a Queensland University who brought native title doctrine through that Marbo case. And basically what it says, it says that this native title doctrine, 1844, this is the, the power of it, it had a letters painting. Letters painting by uh, King William. which would have been pre-830s, I suppose. 
Uh, he only had a five year round, King William. Huh? William the Fourth, thanks, Jeff. <coughs> Letters Pain by King William the Fourth, the native title doctrine. That doctrine, I can't I think it's 18, 18 something. Anyway, during the Marbo, <coughs> when this whole doctrine came out, the whole High Court was yes, the Aboriginal people did have this doctrine, this letters paint from the Crown, some, some rights. And one of the rights in there, and there's three, the three rights I really want to assign to the Indigenous people. One of the rights is called uh, user factory rights. Does anyone know what a user factory right is? Huh? Basically, you can count your own money. <laughs> the right to use something. Yeah, right to use. User, user of factory. So they've got their own propriety rights. Another thing is propriety rights. Between user factory rights and propriety rights, they can turn that asset of the land into their own financial exchange. Create their own bank. Another thing that's really in there is they have this qualified dominion. Create their own country. Very powerful stuff, isn't it? They have a right to create their own dominion, user factory right, priority rights and qualified right. They have a right to do this, 1840s. No one wanted to know because there's gold in there, their ground, survival of the fittest. You know, good old bloody Darwin theory of evolution. Both of the Christians, it's money to be made. Still not, but that came out in 1993. <coughs> Australian Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia, it's got a letters painting from the Crown, 1901. Technically in law, first in time, first in law, their letters point, painting has got more authority than their letters painting. Their letters painting, factory rights, proprietary rights, qualified dominion, very good place to do a Lex Lockie. Rooted Raw Venture, just wait a second. Away from a letters painting which is based on common use revenue and war, which is bankrupt and kids committing suicide. Can you see who's got the right of law on this land for a healthy future? Marbo, this has been passed by the High Court. Johnny Howard, our John Howard, I'm not going to say much about John, when he came in, Australian, Australian Liberal Party at the time, they just panicked. So what did they do? What did they do? They created a Native Title Act. <laughs> Bastardised the law so a bunch of white fellas can use the user factory rights and do the bureaucracy of counting the money from them, basically. I met a commercial lawyer, a white commercial lawyer who's... Uh, Used to work with um, Malcolm Turnbull. There's also the guy who um, helped Twiggy Twiggy Forrester. I, I I talked to him about user factory. Yeah, they know. He, he, these commercial lawyers all know that. Basically, they've taken the wealth away, the future wealth of the Aboriginals, and put into the bureaucracy of the Australian government. That's what happens when you're crying that, because it's statute. Once you put a statute, there's all these rules and regulations and licences and da-da-da. I'm saying to the Indigenous people, no, you're right, you can go right across that act. <coughs> your right has go right across that act. Your right, when it comes to your hereditary right as your family, that's before 1901, can go right across that act. If you understand custom and usage law. What, what's... Uh, good. Yeah, 1836, thanks, Helen. Hel Helen's an uh, Indigenous friend of mine. She, 
she can explain how the indigenous people are really working on this, man, because it's the survival of the people here, you know what I mean? That's what they're reading it for. And yeah, the South Australian mob, they're right on it. They've actually took this whole thing to the High Court just recently, you know, I think it was six to one in favour who voted for them. There's, there's, there's an amazing transformation going on here, consciously. You don't think Abbott can figure this out, hey? Right? You can't... Canberra's dead, man. It can bury, you know. Yeah. Can't do anything else. Is it locked down? Yeah. Well, they say they're a corporation within the constitution, so they're caught up in that whole administration rule of just trying to pay off this debt. Now, who are you paying the debt to is another question, isn't it? This this good question. So I'm. Now, what's happened? I just want to keep in the night title lap. This is where it's getting even more criminal, just from my point of view. <laughs> What's happening with the indigenous people up the land? You know, um, because they're very uh, image people, when I show them documentation, they can't get their heads around the world. I say, don't worry about the words, mate. Can you see the lion and the unicorn? I say, yeah, brother, yeah. What's your totem, brother? I say, I'm stingray, man. Yeah, I'm, you know, straight away we're opening up. It's great. And I said, well, initially we were because my totem's a dragon. I go in there with a Celtic dragon. I'm going to show you some letterheads. Jeff can show that over breaks. And I'm saying that there's a difference between the lion and the unicorn and the kangaroo and the emu of the Australian government, brother. Because the Australian government was set up by Gough Whitman. I'll, I'll talk about it in the next section. The Australian government, uh, the lion and the unicorn, um, kangaroo and the emu, and Gough Whitman set that up in 18, uh, 17... 1973 too. Basically, he just created a, a financial trust company. All right. So when it comes to the indigenous land tiles and that, I said, mate, your your totem's got to go with the lion and the unicorn because that can deal with the kangaroo and the emu shit. Hey, all right, brother. Oh, yeah. And I'm and I'm I'm getting really good with them on that. But what's happened with this Native Title Act? They got this thing to come out and. 2011 called the Native Title Consent Determination. Now this, by law, to me, is just so criminal. Signed off by a federal judge, not a Crown judge, a federal judge. Native Title Consent Determination has not received royal assent. Why? Because it's a consent determination. It can only exist through consent. It's not a law. It's really interesting that what's really tied closely to the consent determination is the mineral, is the um, uh, Mining Rights Act. So you're wondering why all these Aboriginal communities are getting closed down because this native title consent determination, there's one or two Indigenous people, I've met them, they didn't know what they were signing. They actually thought they were getting the land back. Way they had the brochure, it was all gloss, all glossy on that, and there's a, you see some of the hours hanging this federal court judge, can't remember his name, I'll drop his name if I can remember, probably. Got that really cheeky smile on, he knows he's doing wrong. You know? He knows he's doing wrong. And all these hours, a big smile and thinking they got the land. And then two years later, because what's happened, native title of consent determination. Because they signed over, the person who wrote this up was a guy named uh, Rodriguez Martinez. He's a super lawyer out of Florida. He's a super lawyer out of Florida. He wrote this consent determination up. Next thing they've got a whole new lien on the Aboriginal lands. And I'm telling the Aboriginal lands that they, you don't know, but they've financially put the ledger book of your property onto their books. Next thing you know, Citibank, after all this, has just put up this great profit margin. They've put a lien on your land you don't even own. The mining companies have just taken a lien of all their property onto their books so they've got the money to start bringing in this um, gas factor and shit. That's how they're operating. And it was signed off by the federal judges. A federal judge. It's not a Royal Supreme Court judge, it's a federal judge. 
So I'm going up there and I'm seeing all the old indigenous people, the law of the land, because these young bucks, who most of them aren't even from their land, are saying, no, it's all corporatised. Uncle, your, your story, your voice has not got no more power in our community. It's all corporation now. It is killing the old people's hearts, mate. When these young blacks aren't even from their land, man. That's, that's the pain I'm going. So, you know, what's going on? What can we do, brother? And I say, well, what we can do, and I want to explain this in a minute. This is me, Jeff. He, he reminds me. He's got it there. We've already got the antidote. <coughs> All right. Oh, my mate friend, Jeff, is Australian Metal Exchange Melbourne at the court of Buckingham Palace. All right. I'll have to read that in a sec, Jeff. Yeah. Just don't throw it at me right now, Jeff. That, that's the sort of information me and Jeff like researching on it, you know, it's the old, old letters patent, the old laws. So basically, if, you, if you've got an old law, you can present that law in the Supreme Court to take on any modern statute legislation, which is just a, a, a debt collecting accountancy squeeze. That's all it is, when you really open it up. I want to explain a bit how to do that later on. Um, but can, can you see here how valuable it is to know the history of the law? Because if, if someone's coming in there and they've got a really quick rush head and they're full of business and they've got three or four guys hanging off their side with suitcases and all that and they get trained to think quick and they're looking for your faults and bang, 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 you know, you're getting more. They really confuse you before you even start, you know what I mean? So, you know, it's really kind of like, no, sorry, mate, you know. I realise that you're stressing, you're trying to get some bucks out of it. It's got nothing to do with me, brother. All right? And so what I want to do in the next section is show you how to uh, stand up to these guys and, and say, no, I've got another story against your licence. But it's really important that you understand your story. You've got to know your heritage or else you're just a citizen of the state. Yeah, well, that's good. One, one of the things... Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the next section, Joe. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a fair statement too because all this knowledge really got busted out of us in the 1860s. <laughs> you know, when the American Civil War happened, it was, this was the start of Federation. There was the military coming in here. It's not about community no more. It's all about getting the resources out of the land. All right, I'll explain a bit in the, in the next section. Yeah, where, where do you sit before that? It's a very big question, Joe. I mean, this is the soul-searching question. Who am I among this, this mayhem that's been going over about 1,440 um, years? It's not an easy question, man. Yeah? We, we do have a way of um, bringing your right into record, and I'll show that in the next bit, you yeah? know? I've got a few more minutes, Seth. So anyone got any quick questions? No. One, one thing about the Aboriginals, the word Aboriginal is a merchant law term. Basically, if I was uh, English and Joe over there was French and we were doing a trade in cotton across the English Channel and we had a contract and uh, the countries went to war, that that contract would become Aboriginal because we become enemy of the state. So the only way an Aboriginal contract could work is through a neutral party. So that's why um, Switzerland was so powerful because Switzerland was a, a neutral party for all these Aboriginal contracts during the wars. Only because Switzerland started the bloody thing. Anyway, that's another story. So when Captain Cook came to Australia and he met his Indigenous people there, because you've got to remember, this is a pretty wild journey for these guys. And the first time they come in, and see a bunch of um, skin bear black fellas there, and there's no civilisation or that. Uh, it was, it was to Joseph Banks who wrote the word Aboriginal. Basically, it means beyond contract. There's no one to do contract with. That's what Aboriginal means. So when the Aboriginals, I say this to me, in Aboriginal mates, don't call yourself Aboriginal, because the only way. If you're an Aboriginal, the only way the government can deal with you is through a neutral party. It used to be the missionary. 
now it's Social Security. So one of the things I'm saying to them, Joe, if they want to get their own coat of arms, tell us what your totem is, brother. Hey, I'm, I'm the stingray. All right, draw your stingray into a cell because the, the court needs to see evidence of fact. As soon as you've put your seal onto a piece of paper and you show the judge, you're no longer Aboriginal, mate. This is you become evidence of fact. This is where you become a people. And through your totem drawn into a herald and a seal, then you can enter the world of equity. But you can't enter it while you're an Aboriginal. Because the term Aboriginal means beyond contract. So this is what I'm saying to the Indigenous people later on, me and Jeff are working on something. If we want to do a financial plan to the Indigenous people, so you've got to paint your totem, brother. Mate, these guys are, <laughs> they're all going off. Because I know their totem. And they're really good drawers, you know. And one thing they do know, what we don't know, is they know the history of their story, man. They know their story. And by Christ, and this by Christ, are they so strong and proud of their story. Every Indigenous person knows their story off the land. They don't know how to represent it. And the representation is just draw your seal and Tote them into a seal, you become a people, and then when you become a people, we can start doing um, not so much contracts with practices, we can still do time deeds, do relationships with them under the English rule of law. Bug the Australian government, the Australian government's bankrupt. You know, I'm, I'm probably getting a lot of trouble saying this right now, but I reckon about 10 or 15 years, everyone going, Good on you, Ross. Yeah, you've, got, you've got to have foresight when you do this stuff. It's not going to happen tomorrow. All right? This thing, especially with Indigenous people, they, one thing I like about them, they're, they're very patient. They can move the earth. And deep down in their dreaming, they know we're killing ourselves. They know that. All right, let's have a bit of a break there and we'll, have, and we'll be back in about 45 minutes. Thank you all.